from my hospital bed, I watched the live news feed of the shuttle landing at the Kennedy Space Center. The man reporting on the ordeal said that something had happened to one of the astronauts. He wasn't able to give specifics. At the time, I didn't realize that the very same hospital I was at would be the one they brought the unconscious astronaut to. I watched as people in hazmat suits rushed up to the shuttle, instruments in their hands as they moved inside. After a few minutes, the people in hazmat suits came out and waved in the paramedics who were standing by. The paramedics were inside for several more minutes before they brought a man out on a stretcher. The reporter said his name was Tim McVeigh and that he was a mission specialist. The paramedics didn't seem to be in a huge rush, so I figured they had him stabilized. As the news channel went to a commercial, I looked out my window at the afternoon sky. I suddenly felt tired, more tired than I had felt immediately after the emergency appendectomy I'd undergone just hours earlier. I let my eyelids shut as the television droned on from the wall. It was the sound of hushed but forceful voices that brought me out of my afternoon nap. The television was off now. A nurse had probably come in and shut it off when it was clear I was sleeping. My door was open and I looked out into the hall, seeing two female doctors and a male nurse gathered there. We're running a full panel along with every other test we can think of, the younger of the two doctors said. His vitals are fine, but he just won't wake up. I don't understand it. The eyes of the entire nation are on the hospital now, the older female doctor said. Figure it out and quick. That comment about the eyes of the nation being on the hospital clicked things into place. I realized that this was the closest hospital to Kennedy Space Center. And although I've never considered myself someone who gushes over celebrities, I did find it pretty exciting that Tim McVeigh was just down the hall from me. So after the impromptu meeting in the hallway broke up, I decided it was time for a little walk. Although I was dealing with a bit of pain around the incision in my lower abdomen, I felt pretty good. I was still groggy from the anesthesia, but otherwise, I felt well enough to take a little nonchalant walk down the corridor. Getting carefully out of bed, I moved to the door and gazed both ways down the hall. I couldn't immediately tell which room the astronaut was in. Then the younger female doctor I'd seen in the hall appeared from a room to my right and across the hall. She noted something on a medical chart and then put the chart into the little holder next to the door before starting off down the hall. I walked out in my hospital socks, thankful I didn't have an IV drip to drag along with me. As I reached the room the doctor had emerged from, I looked inside and saw Tim McVeigh lying in the single bed inside. He wore a dark mustache and a couple of days worth of stubble on his cheeks. His eyes were closed and he was completely still. He was dressed in the same kind of hospital gown as me and the blanket was pulled up to his waist. There were all kinds of wires and tubes attached to him, running to machines that beeped and displayed numbers on their screens. He wasn't on a respirator, so I guessed he was breathing on his own. I didn't know what I expected when deciding to come take a look at him. And as I was just about to turn and head back to my room, his right foot moved. It was little more than a twitch, but it caught my attention. I thought maybe he was waking up. The foot twitched again under the blanket, and again. Then it seemed to stretch, like McVeigh was getting ready to wake up, easing his tensed muscles. But the stretch continued, and the foot got further and further away from the rest of him. As I watched the sharp lump under the blanket move toward the very foot of the bed, I struggled to comprehend what I was seeing. It was impossible. Then the foot reached the edge of the bed and the blanket fell flat as it thumped onto the tile floor. Only it wasn't just a foot. It was his leg from the foot up to the middle of the shin. But there was no blood. And there was something else. Something even more disturbing than a severed foot moving on its own away from its owner's body. From the back of the heel to where the shin ended at a smooth nub, there were dozens of little legs sprouting from the skin. They were like a centipede's legs, only bigger. These legs moved in perfect unison, carrying the leg away from the bed and turning it toward the door, toward me. As it came, the foot started to mutate, splitting and changing form until it was a hideous, eyeless beast. The legs joined, forming fewer, larger legs. 
The foot itself split lengthwise down the middle, revealing rows of sharp teeth on either side. The two halves snapped together quickly, like a crab testing its claws. A strained giggle left my mouth, sounding very much like it belonged to someone else. I had a moment to think that this was a dream. I thought I might still be under the effects of the anesthesia. But as much as I wanted to believe that, I knew it wasn't true. Thankfully, my legs worked on their own, backing me away from the room and the creature inside scurrying toward me. Sir, you'll have to leave, the young female doctor said from beside me. I pointed into the room without looking at her, and she turned her face away from mine to look. Meanwhile, I continued backing away until I felt myself hit the wall. The doctor opened her mouth to scream just as the creature reached the threshold. It leaped up at the doctor, its scissor-like jaws opening up and snapping around the woman's throat in a spray of blood, cutting her scream off just a split second after it started. The creature seemed to flow into the woman's neck, collapsing and disappearing like a slow-motion magic trick. But then a bulge formed on the side of the doctor's head, and it quickly formed into a distorted version of the true head beside it. Both mouths were open. Both sets of eyes were alive with agonized pain. It was as if the creature was testing its abilities. Pressed up against the wall, I watched this in shocked horror, so engrossed in the impossibility of it that I didn't notice the uniformed soldier just down the hall. Not until he fired his gun and both heads exploded as the bullet tore through them. Little bits of flesh and blood splashed against my face. More soldiers ran up and started taking control of the situation. For a few minutes, the hospital was a madhouse of official activity as they locked everything down. They separated those of us who might have been exposed to the strange creature, and now we're all under quarantine on one floor of the hospital. I find myself lying in a hospital bed again, waiting to see if something terrible will happen to me, or if I'll be able to go home soon. The only consoling factor is that I'm not unconscious like the astronaut was. That has to mean something. But as I lie here, praying I'm not infected or invaded or whatever you want to call it, something awful happens. My foot twitches under the covers. It happens fast, too fast to be anything natural, too deadly, too brutal. One second, I'm helping to calm down a mentally ill patient who's getting belligerent with the doctors and nurses. The next, my boss's voice comes over the radio, screaming about putting the hospital into lockdown. Since I'm near the security office, I rush over to see what all the commotion is about while other security guards start locking the place down. I step into the office to find my boss, a fat guy named Rodero, pointing a gun at my face. Christ, Foreman, he says, lowering the gun. What are you doing in here? Go help get the door shut. What's the situation, sir? I ask, pushing down my anger at having a gun pointed at me. Look at this shit, Rodero says, sitting down again behind the monitoring station. I move around the desk to look at the monitors. Rodero sets his gun down on the desk next to the keyboard and points at a camera feed from the fourth floor. On the screen, about a dozen people are banging on the reinforced sliding glass doors to the infectious diseases area. But they aren't just any people. They're all massive, blowing up like balloons getting ready to pop. And they have strange patches of red, irritated skin on their faces and arms. What the hell? I say, looking closer. Is that Nurse Carter? Rodero nods. Yup. No way. How's that even possible? I just saw her half an hour ago, and it looks like she's gained a good 50 pounds. That's what I'm saying, Rodero says. That's what we're dealing with here. It ain't good, man. It ain't good at all. What's that shit on their faces? I don't know. Some kind of fungus? Whatever it is, they all had it before they got all big like that. What the hell could do that? I say, I never heard of any virus or fungus or anything that can do that. Oh, sh**, Rodero says, looking at another camera feed. I follow his gaze and see several thickening people wandering down the hallway on the second floor, rubbing their faces. That red shit is growing on them. They're coming toward the stairwell, I say. Go lock it, Rodero says. If they get to it before you, I'll radio you and let you know. Why don't you lock it, I say. I don't want to go out there and get infected. Rodero grabs his gun and picks it up. Because I'm your f***ing boss, he says. But he really means, because I have the f***ing gun. You're not even supposed to have that thing on hospital property, I say. 
Just go, Pullman, he says. Now. I run out of the security office, past the admin offices, and to the stairwell. Someone is on the PA system, telling people to be calm. What are they doing? I ask over the radio as I burst into the stairwell. There's no answer from Rodero, but I keep going. I reach the second floor landing and lock the door with a key on my key ring. Then I hear a crackle over the radio before Rodero shouts. Get out of there, Pullman! There's a massive bang against the door I just locked, followed by the creaking sound of stressed metal. And then the screaming starts from the other side. But even over the five or six different voices screaming, I can hear the door creak and groan as the people push it from the other side, bowing the middle of it out toward me. Realizing the door won't hold, I turn to run back down to the first floor just before the lock gives way and the door breaks open. I'm at the landing between the first and second floors when I look up and see something I can't quite comprehend at first. The people I saw moving toward the door when I was in the security office are there, but not how I expected to see them. They're no longer separate people. They've all been joined together by that strange red substance on their skin. They're just a jumble of screaming faces and writhing limbs, and they keep expanding. They fill the entire doorway, spilling through like some sort of cohesive sludge. The wall above the door cracks from the ever-expanding pressure. I run back down toward the security office, through a panicked admin area. People are rushing around, most of them trying to figure out what the hell is happening. As I approach the security office, I hear a gunshot from inside. I pause briefly, wondering what it could mean, before opening the door. Rodero is slumped in his seat, the back of his head missing. The gun is on the floor next to his chair. There's no one else in the room, making it clear that he took his own life. But I don't understand why. Not until I step closer and see that strange reddish substance on his face and arms. Fear strikes me to my core. But I notice something on the security feeds. On nearly every single one of them, people are either swelling up or have inflated and have joined together with each other. As I watch, there's a great cracking sound from above. I look up to see the ceiling splitting like a fault line, white plaster dust floating down. The walls of the hospital groan as the security feeds go out, the cameras smothered by whatever the people have become. Thinking I'm surely infected too, I check my arms, nothing. My face feels fine, my belt doesn't feel any tighter. I rush out of the office and toward the nearest exit. And I'm just about to reach the door when the first floor of the hospital buckles and the ceiling falls on me. Man, this coffee is terrible, I said to Ellie. We were sitting in the cafeteria in our scrubs, sipping the morning's first cup of coffee before our shift started. Ellie shrugged. It's not so bad with cream and sugar, she said. Besides, it's the poor girl's first day, and apparently Nathan had to go home sick, so he couldn't train her properly. I turned in my seat to look at the new barista behind the little coffee kiosk in the corner of the cafeteria. She was young, maybe 20, and looked like a lost lamb as she served a couple of cups to Dr. Malik and the head of the hospital security, Phil Thompson. I watched as the two men threw a few dollars in the tip jar and then turned away. They sipped their coffees and grimaced, I couldn't help but laugh. They came over to the table and Dr. Malik bent down. How hard is it to make a decent cup of coffee? He whispered. I mean, it's not brain surgery. I resisted an eye roll. As a doctor specializing in neurosurgery and clearly lacking a sense of humor, Malik made the it's not brain surgery joke several times a week. But since he and my boss were pals, I gave a little <laughs> laugh. So did Ellie. Smiling at his own amazing joke, Malik walked away with Thompson by his side. When they were a safe distance away, Ellie rolled her eyes. That guy's the worst. I nodded. Did you hear that another family filed a malpractice suit against him? Ugh, the board should do what I'm about to do with this cup of coffee and drop him quick. I thought you said the coffee was okay with cream and sugar, I said smiling. I was just being nice, it's terrible. Ellie set her coffee aside, but I finished mine while we chatted. I needed the caffeine. Then we got to work. I was in the middle of taking over my patients from the night shift nurse assigned to them when I heard Phil Thompson's voice come over the PA system. Code Silver! He said, nearly screaming. Code Silver! They're everywhere! The night shift nurse, a guy named Pearson, had been in the middle of giving me the rundown. 
He stopped mid-sentence and looked at me. My eyes went wide. Code silver meant there was someone with a weapon in the building and possibly even a hostage situation. My stomach clenched as fear bloomed inside me. I listened for the sound of gunshots or screaming, but heard neither at the moment. They're everywhere, Pearson said. What the hell does that mean? Are we being invaded? I shook my head, looking over his shoulder. I suddenly felt nauseous. At the end of the corridor, where the hallway made a turn, shadows danced as people moved quickly, following the shelter-in-place protocols. Then someone screamed. I thought it sounded like Ellie, but I couldn't be sure. The noise sent my nerves into overdrive. Pearson turned and looked that way, toward the commotion near the end of the hall. There was more screaming, and I thought it was coming from around the corner. No! Someone screamed. No! A hulking black figure rounded the corner at a run. It looked like something out of one of my childhood nightmares. Its arms were too long, legs thick and powerful. Its dark skin shimmered like the surface of a pool of used motor oil, and its small, evil eyes were fixed on me. I darted into the nearby room of an elderly patient, slamming the door behind me. Only after I'd shut the door did I think about Pearson, but it was too late. He was on his own. I pressed my back to the door, shutting my eyes and hoping to wake up. Monsters aren't real, I told myself. They don't exist. But the screaming coming from outside told me otherwise. A strange noise from inside the room caught my attention. I opened my eyes to see a distorted figure before me. His face, a mass of melting flesh, arms reaching out for me, fingers tipped with yellow claws. I screamed, ah! reaching into a pocket of my scrubs for the bandage scissors I always carried with me for cutting dressings and tape. I stabbed out with the scissors, feeling the tip enter the monster's flesh. It gasped and lurched away from me, dripping dark blood that sizzled as it hit the floor. The creature bounced around the room, making strange noises, before heading back toward me. I had an idea that it was going to try to melt me with its acid blood. I turned and fled from the room, but as soon as I stepped out into the hall, three of those dark figures closed in on me. Their small, evil eyes were lifeless, seeing into me. Their complete lack of emotion struck me to my heart, and I knew they meant to consume me. They wanted to make me just like them. Scissors still in my hand, I slashed out at the nearest one. I missed, and another one of the creatures slammed into me from the other side. I fell to the ground with the creature on top of me, hitting the side of my head on the floor. Screaming, I tried to fight the thing off. I felt it wrench the scissors out of my hand before binding my wrists together. I fought, but I knew it would do no good. They had me. They were going to tear out my humanity. They were going to win. I waited for them to tear into me, waited for the pain but it never came. Instead, there was nothing more than a little prick on my arm. And soon enough, my eyelids grew heavy and my heart slowed from its rampant pace. It took me a while to understand that there had been no monsters. I had not been attacked. In fact, I had done the attacking. The detective in charge of the case explained to me that the new barista had poisoned the coffee with a mixture of LSD, psilocybin, and PCP. Her father had died in the hospital six months earlier, while Dr. Malik was performing a stereotactic brain biopsy, a relatively low risk and common procedure. She blamed Dr. Malik and the hospital for her father's death and decided to seek revenge. She even poisoned the kiosk manager that morning so he would go home sick, allowing her to poison the coffee. I wasn't the only one to freak out. Everyone who had a cup of the tainted coffee experienced something although not all of their experiences were quite as intense as mine. The code Silver Thompson called was due to a hallucination, and that just set things off. The creature I stabbed was an elderly patient named Derek Branch, but the non-compromised staff members were able to save him. Thank God. As for Dr. Malik, the girl got what she wanted. He jumped off the roof of the hospital around the same time I was being subdued and sedated by three security guards. He said something about being chased by the ghosts of his dead patients before he ran up to the roof. I'm just lucky I didn't kill anyone, or myself. And since then, the hospital has made a change. We now have a single serving machine to make our coffee. It doesn't taste much better than the hallucinogen laced drink we were served that morning, but at least we know it's safe. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.